Libby said, my wife says, who unfortunately can't be with us tonight, uh, says that I'm a terrible mumbler, so uh, forgive me. I was going to say a word or two about Vlad and why I thought Vlad was a good choice to interview me. When you become a, a U.S. ambassador, and this is true with you know political ambassadors and career ambassadors, um, even if you're a career ambassador and you're rotating through Romania for three years, you probably don't know enough about Romania to be a good ambassador. And so the State Department has an excellent program where they train ambassadors and educate them about the, their host country. And uh, the State Department told me from the very beginning that the one professor that I had to get to know was Vlad Tismanianu. And I immediately asked for a couple of his books, and I read two or three of your books uh, before we had a seminar with Vlad. And I can't remember who, what the other academics were who were in the room at the time, but we spent almost a half a day discussing the politics and the rule of law uh, and the political institutions in Romania. And it was a, an incredibly valuable um, lesson for me in getting ready uh, for my job. And I want to just say one word about a very courageous thing that Vlad did, which was only just mentioned in the introduction, and that's Vlad's role as the chair of the commission that examined the history of, uh, of the communist uh, regime in Romania, which is, remains an extremely controversial topic. Uh, unfortunately, the work of that commission is still not done. Uh, but um, I think what will come out in this dialogue, as you hear, is that, uh, is that the, the, the remnants of that regime and that uh, terrible dark page in Romanian history uh, remains in place in Romania. And Vlad has spent his life trying to expose what happened and, and trying to encourage Romania to come to grips with that. So um, without further ado, we should begin, I think. Oh, OK, let me try to make sure. That, do you hear me? Okay, wonderful. Okay, uh, first of all, I want to uh, to thank uh, the Hill Center for organizing this event and to thank Ambassador Mark Gittenstein to, for having thought of me to be the, um, let's say, partner in this dialogue, uh, moderator of this event. Uh, the first thing I would say about the uh, uh, Hill Center is that this is one of the things that probably will have a chance to chat a little bit about, and that's the presence, the absence, or in between presence and absence of civil society initiatives. Mm -hmm. This is an example of a group of people turning a dilapidated, forgotten place and making it a really vibrant um, scene or, or opportunity or uh, whatever you want to call it, for uh, intellectual uh, undertakings from music to uh, political debates and so on. So I think this is a great thing. Uh, I have a number of questions and uh, I were told that the whole event should uh, last for uh, maximum one hour. Uh, so we'll try to, to, to meet the expectations of the organizers. And uh, this is how I see the event. Uh, I'll have uh, one or two things to say about uh, Mark Gittenstein and the, 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 the turbulent Romanian landscape at this moment or before this moment. And then I have a number of questions that as, as we proceed, I'll come with the questions. And uh, obviously the questions would be invitations for Ambassador Gittenstein to say what he thinks about these issues. I hope they are provocative enough or thought provoking enough in order to generate the type of answers that uh, I'm sure uh, Mr. Gittenstein is going to give us. Uh, so uh, I'll start with a personal recollection. It was in 2009. And uh, at that moment, uh, that was, as you know, at the Foreign Service, Service Institute, these type of briefings are supposed to be, and they should be, and they ought to be, off the record. Uh, sometimes they are not, but that doesn't matter. Some people, uh, you know, convey publicly things that some of us say, you know, convinced that they are confidential. Uh, but this being said, at this moment, what I answered you, because you asked me, can you tell me more about, since you've been working closely with President Traian Basescu, who was the president at that moment and was re-elected president of Romania in uh, December 2009, uh, during your uh, term, at the beginning actually of your term there. Can you tell me what you think and what would be the um, kind of historical, political or cultural analogies you can come with? 
And uh, I gave, I remember vividly, and I'll say why now it can be in the public domain, because you, do, you are not ambassador anymore, and mm -hmm. as you know, I don't particularly care. I come with this kind of things publicly anyway. So, uh, and I said, if I were to compare, if I went, were to find a personality that, uh, or a cultural figure that Basescu reminds me somewhat of, would be Henry V. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and basically the argument was the following. Yes, he's part of the Romanian political class, which you all know has long traditions of corruption and long traditions of clientelism and long traditions of many, many things that we associate traditionally with the Balkans and no, not only with the Balkans. At the same time, so was Prince Hal. After all, he started his career, you pronounce Hal, right? Okay, so uh, he started basically like a, uh, you know, very much involved in uh, drinking and being cr great friends of uh, Falstaff and Pistol and all the very, you know, non-frequentable individuals. And then he became Henry V. And as a king, he became very different from the young adventurer he was. He broke with them. That basically led to Falstaff's melancholy and final death, in as much as I remember. Because he refused to socialize with Falstaff anymore, which was perhaps nasty in terms of friendship, but good in terms of statesmanship. <laughs> okay, so this was the figure. Now I say it's public because the volume is coming out at uh, the book fair in Bucharest in two weeks. And it's a volume of dialogue. The title is The Book of Presidents, with a young Romanian journalist who asks me, can you give me three very brief definitions in cultural history or history of literature of the three Romanian presidents who you have known quite well? And I answered, okay, and it's going to be on the jacket of the book. Ion Iliescu, Macbeth, uh, Emil Constantinescu, Hamlet, uh, Triumph Basescu, Henry V. Okay, so that's going to be on the jacket of the book. The, the rest is hermeneutics. You interpret why I said this. This being said, uh, going back to that moment in uh, the summer of 2009, when, of course, the political atmosphere in Romania was as usually electric and uh, as usually very polarized, and lots of, it's after all, let's keep in mind from the beginning, because you deal here with somebody who is a uh, consummate Washingtonian, who ended up in a very Mediterranean political atmosphere. Uh, that's the fact. It's a southern country. It's, it's basically, if you want to understand Romanian politics, you look into Greek politics, into Italian politics, into Latin America, or perhaps Italy, Portugal, that's, that's the connection you have to, it's a Latin country with all the characteristics of a Latin, you know, the media is very much into editorializing. If you look for a newspaper that's going to give you, you know, hard information and nothing else, uh, you travel to another country. It's not going to happen very easily in Romania. Okay, so uh, my first question, this, uh, this was the preface to my uh, remarks, but the first question would be, uh, remembering the moment that uh, we met at the Foreign Service Institute in uh, whatever it was, July probably, or June in, uh, 2009. Before, uh, Mark, you went to Romania, what were your expectations? Uh, at that moment, Romania was a NATO member and uh, was already a European Union member. Uh, Romania had experienced, and we talked about it, a bumpy transition. And there were plenty of challenges to democratic consolidations, but also a number of great opportunities. What were your expectations when you went to that country, and how would you compare your expectations to the beginning of your experience? Well, <clears throat> I didn't have specific expectations uh, about what you're talking about. In other words, what my relationship would be with the president. By the way, it's very important to understand, when you're the US ambassador, your primary obligation is you are the interlocutor between the Romanian head of state and the U.S. head of state. In other words, my major job was to facilitate the relationship between President Pesescu, that's who Vlad is talking about, and President Obama. So I was focused on the question of how do I keep that relationship alive, especially in a circumstance where the United States, while they felt Romania was important, I knew from the very beginning that it's not like President Obama is going to pick up the phone and call President Basescu on a regular basis. Now, it's interesting that uh, President Bush did do that with Basescu, and the reason was because in the uh, you know in the early part of the century, uh, Romania was an was an important ally, remains an important ally in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it was critical to the United States to keep 
Romania engaged in Afghanistan. By the time I got there, by the way, every, almost everybody was out of Iraq. Romania, well, by the way, is one of the last to leave Iraq. So my primary responsibility was to keep those 2,000 Romanian GIs engaged in Afghanistan uh, and, and uh, pr provide force protection for them because many of them were dying from IEDs, et cetera. That's what I was focused on. And I, when I first met with Pesescu, I, I thought my primary responsibility uh, was to keep them engaged, provide them with the equipment they needed. That's what I was thinking of. I remember I had talked to my two predecessors uh, who had become very engaged on similar issues. And one of them in particular, who I admire a great deal, was very active on the issue of corruption. And by the way, corruption and rule of law, as Vlad says, is at the heart of the transition challenges that Romania faces. And I remember thinking to myself, I am not going to make the mistakes that Michael Guest did. I'm not going to get out front on this issue. I am a lawyer. I do care about these things, but what I'm going to focus on are the national security issues. Uh, and uh, of course, within six months, it became obvious to me that you have to be outspoken on these issues. Uh, Romanians, uh, uh, I have to remain, I'm still a, a diplomat at heart, so I have to be careful about the way I say this. Romanians uh, can be very nice to your face, very uh, polite. And, and tell you what you want to hear, but in your heart of hearts sometimes you have to be very blunt with Romanian politicians and people in government. And I learned it within months of getting there that I had to be very blunt about these issues. Uh, and I became increasingly outspoken and what I, what the approach I started with was not the approach I ended up with. And for those of you who don't know what happened there last summer, and we'll, I'm sure gonna get, we're, we're gonna get into this, there was a, by the way, if you're interested in this topic, there was an excellent editorial uh, in the Washington Post about this uh, in July of last year. I can, we can get, get the site for you, which describes very accurately what happened with the rule of law and the constitutional crisis that Romania uh, went through. But everything I did from the moment I got there until July was in a sense a, a buildup. The, the denouement of the story was what happened in July of last year. Uh, but it was became obvious to me the longer I was there that what I started with was not what, what I was going to end up with. Uh, and I became very engaged politically uh, and, and in the press in a way that I had never intended to, but which my government wanted me to do. So um, uh, I guess the, the long answer to your question was uh, it wasn't simply about Bisescu. It was about the relationship between the two countries. It became obvious to me that our obligations in terms of assuring that democracy survived and flourished in Romania required me to be more outspoken and more engaged on issues I never intended to be engaged on. In a way, you answered, and I'm going to say what I had, as, as if you had read my uh, comments and questions here. As ambassador, you played an important role, and I can testify for that in Romania. I mean, there were lots of references to the presence and the interventions, public interventions of the U.S. ambassador, in this case, uh, Mark Gittenstein. Uh, and I would emphasize something, uh, since you answered what is the U.S. and how you saw the U.S. role in Romania. Let me ask you another question. Uh, at a uh, survey that uh, was organized probably three or four years ago, but I don't think that fundamentally, regardless of some very shrill statements from, uh, coming from some particular politicians in Romania, on one particular politician, if I, influential, I don't speak about the fringe, I speak about mainstream politicians, and only one that has come with this kind of anti-American, anti-Western statements. Uh, the surveys describe in Europe, uh, it was a survey on anti-Americanism in Europe, and anti-North American, anti-US, okay? So, uh, do be clear, it's not about Canada or Mexico, and so it's about the US. Okay, so, uh, and on a scale, it, they, they work with a scale of anti-North Americanism, and on this scale, the two, from the highest level of anti-Americanism to the lowest level. There are two places, it's quite interesting, uh, where it was the lowest level. I don't think Russia was included, or the Russian Federation, Europe without Russia. Okay, uh, were Kosovo, interesting enough, so much about Islam and Muslim world being automatically knee-jerk anti-American. It's very important what US policy is applied. In Kosovo, they are Muslims, and they are the most pro-US 
okay? So it's no direct connection between being Muslim and being anti-American, okay? In Kosovo, they are pro-American. That's one case, and Romania, okay? A very high level of pro-US. So let me ask you, before we go into the crisis of 2012, which I'm going to have some questions about that, uh, but because in 2012 there were voices like, for instance, I know it's on the record, but you don't need to say anything. I can be on the record with anything I want to say. Uh, the president of the Romanian Senate and the president of also one of the two, uh, the co-chairman of the uh, of the uh, ruling coalition, the Union of Social, whatever it's called, Liberals or something like that, USL in Romanian, uh, the Social Liberal Union, exactly, that's the name. Uh, Mr. Crin Antonescu said publicly he's going to be running for president probably next year in 2014 and he was asked are you afraid of any domestic competitor and so on he said no the only real competitor i'll have in 2014 he said it only once but i remember it would be the u.s state department remember that one now uh <laughs> you know that he said i'm simply quoting uh did you feel during the three years that you spent there or what are your perceptions it's obviously a human perception, but I'm sure your colleagues and you had conversations. And what are your perceptions about how Romanians relate, or the Romanian, let's use the horrible term, elites, how do they uh, feel about the United States? Well, I, for the full three years I was there, I felt very embraced by the Romanian people at all levels. Um, Romania is the most pro-American country in Europe. I think Vlad is absolutely right. We saw that, by the way, one of my responsibilities was to convince the Romanians, which was not hard to do, to place the famous anti-ballistic missile system in Romania. And we had a vote in the Romanian Senate to ratify. I had to negotiate that treaty. These are the missiles that were designed to defend Europe uh, against threats from the Middle East without getting into the countries. You can use your imagination to know who they are. Uh, and we we convinced the Romanians to put the missiles in place, and then we we had to negotiate a treaty, and then we, that I had to get the treaty through the Romanian Senate. It passed the Romanian Senate unanimously. If you can imagine, that wouldn't happen in the United States on any piece of legislation, certainly. And I think it's because politically, it was not only that they did all the Romanians want this, but it was because the United States wanted it, and they wanted to be close to the United States. It was politically dangerous to be uh, uh, on the wrong side of the United States. And that was a tremendous advantage to me as the U.S. ambassador because people cared what I thought. They cared what the United States stood for. Uh, and they wanted to be, uh, the way the, the, uh, the euphemism Romanians use is the transatlantic relationship. Well, that's really the relationship between the United States and Romania. Why that is, I'm going to have to turn to Vlad. I can tell you that one of the things that I... Um, I did as I uh, was preparing to come to Romania, and I encourage if you're interested in Romania, you should do it, is you should watch Romanian movies. They are among the best movies in the world. There's a great, uh, I can't remember his name, one of the great reviewers in Los Angeles wrote a review of one of the Romanian movies and said, and the title of it is, Can the Romanians Make a Bad Movie? Because they are really phenomenal movies, and they're tremendous insight into the Romanian character. One of the movies is actually a joint American-Romanian production. It's called California Dreaming. And it's a wonderful movie. You can get it on Netflix. Uh, and the movie is, uh, I won't go through the whole story of the, of the movie, but it's about an American military unit that's going into Serbia and meeting up with a Romanian unit. It gets stopped on the, about 20 miles shy of the Serbian border by a local prefect who won't allow the train to go through. Uh, and it's a very funny story because it's about all the American military guys falling in love with the beautiful Romanian women. And every day, Armand Asante, who plays the uh, the military commander of the of the American troop, goes in to see the prefect to have suica, which is the local drink. And uh, he keeps asking, "Why won't you let me through?" Three nights, nothing won't send. And finally, the third night, he said, "We've been waiting for the Americans for 60 years, <laughs> and we're not going to let you." leave. And I think there's a lot of that mentality. I think there, if you talk to Romanians about the United States, even when we were allied against, we were, you know, the Romanians were initially allied with the Germans in the war. When they shot down American pilots, they treated them like kings. I met some of these pilots. 
They were treated wonderfully by the Romanians. They loved Americans, even back then. And indeed, they wanted us, they eventually switched sides in the war. That's a, for another, we can talk about that later. But the point was, they loved America and they were waiting for America for 60 years. If I find it hard to understand, we didn't show up until 1989, really. And yet they still love us. And I think it's something in the Latin character. I, I, I can't quite understand it. But culturally, you go anywhere in Romania and you find, have this tremendous feeling of warmth and, and being embraced. Now, an, an additional uh, ingredient, I'm going on a little too long here, is that I'm Romanian-American. I'm the first Romanian-American ever to serve as U.S. ambassador in Romania, and they love that. Uh, and I never missed an opportunity to remind them of that. So. Okay, uh, I'll give a very brief um, uh, survey or, uh, you know, um, ref, a uh, number of points, reference points about what happened, the crisis of 2012. It was a major crisis and it can be described as an almost breakdown of the Romanian legal system. In other words, we have long studied, people in my field, which is the field of comparative politics and so on, we've studied democratization, that's the trend, or democratic consolidation, on transitions to democracy, and all the rest. Here we had a case, and by the way, since you read editorials in the Washington Post, you can also compare what's going on in Hungary, which is a very interesting case, and I coined the term that at this moment perhaps we should talk about de-democratization. So after we had democratization at a certain moment, and Europe is not prepared, European Union. Uh, you, the Union was not prepared and written and so on to, for absorbing Eastern Europe. The founding fathers of the European Union didn't expect this group to come, okay? The barbarians came, okay, if you want. They were at the gates and, you know, the founding fathers were pretty happy with that. And by the way, until the disaster in the former Yugoslavia, the first stage of European Union reaction to what ha was happening was Maastricht, which meant deepening, not enlargement. The first stage. It's only when the Yugoslav, Yugoslav crisis reached the proportions it reached, and it was clear that Europe had to do something, that they moved from deepening into enlargement. That's mid-1990s. It didn't start like that. There was a lot of resistance to that. Okay, so the president was suspended. There was a coalition. I'm not going to go into details. Basically, the constitutional court's decision were ignored to such an extent that the constitutional court, which, by the way, it's important for the people here to know, constitutional courts existed perhaps even, not perhaps, certainly even before World War II, but it was a response of a number of constitutional designers in Germany, Italy, Austria, etc., to the possibility of a new breakdown, like the Nazi breakdown, or the coming to power via constitutional and parliamentary means of an anti-constitutional, anti-parliamentary party. So that's the reason why the Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe, Germany, is such an important institution. It's the crucial institution at this moment, basically, in the German political system. They are enormously important. So basically, the Constitutional Court in Romania appealed to the Venice Commission, which is the monitoring commission of the European uh, system, and said, help, SOS. An SOS, that was something absolutely unprecedented, and Europe didn't know how to react. That involved a number of personalities, and I would say the three most important personalities, if one day, and I know people are writing books about that, they were uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel of Germany, uh, the President of the European Union, Jose Manuel Barroso, and, um, if I may say so, Ambassador Mark Gittenstein. He was caught in the middle of a maelstrom. Okay, so can you share with us about what the was happening at that moment, and what did you feel at the moment when everything that you had built, rule of law, um, trips of Romanian lawyers to the States to understand how, all the good things seemed to suddenly fall apart? Well, let me just begin with a little preface here. I know there are a couple of lawyers in the audience. I see my friend Guy Martin here. You know, we take for granted in the United States that we have a legal system that respects the rule of law, and you have a court system and judges who, on their own, and with their own integrity at stake, will follow the law no matter what. And we have prosecutors who feel independent enough to, to take on uh, illegality and corruption without fear of their lives or their reputations. We take that for granted here. I took that for granted coming to Romania. Uh, 
And by the way, Romania made tremendous progress, probably more progress than any other country in the Balkans, and in some respects because of President Bisescu, also because see, we have representatives of the IMF, also because of the IMF, and also because of the EU, because the EU and the process of enlargement imposed conditions and integration requirements upon Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, uh, in other words, in order to get in the EU, in order to become a part of NATO, they had to make changes in the way their government was structured so that they began to apply the rule of law and uh, empower prosecutors and, and, and adopt rules of, of, um, of transparency. Now, what happened was one of the conditions of the IMF, the IMF lent 20 billion euros to Romania the year I got there, and then they imposed conditions, austerity, packages, which were very difficult for Romania, and reform of the state, which began to really bite and affect average Romanians who, by the way, there were 400,000, there still are 400,000 Romanians working for state-owned enterprises in Romania. Uh, there are people that uh, uh, were getting very high pensions and basically uh, uh, the, Romania couldn't afford this. So this had a huge impact on the politics of Romania beginning in 2012. And, uh, and basically, a revolt began to take place in Romania, just as you saw throughout Southern Europe. Uh, although I would argue it was much exaggerated. It was not nearly as bad in Romania as it was in Greece or Portugal or Spain. So these changes began to happen, and, and uh, the government fell in April of uh, 2012. Unfortunately, this happened at exactly the moment that the prosecutors were beginning to succeed in going after high-level officials. And uh, some of those officials were related to people in the new governing coalition, and they wanted to take over the presidency. This is my view, and that was, the, by the way, the view of the U.S. government, that they wanted to take over the presidency basically to gain control of the judicial system, not unlike what you've seen in other countries in the world uh, uh, further to the east of Romania. Uh, and I saw this as a threat to democracy, and so did the State Department, and so we began to speak out on it. Now, during this period, um, there were actions taken, and you, you, there's plenty to read about this. We know there's no need to get into this level of detail here today unless you're interested. But Romania, that coalition, Romania, uh, the Romanian government at that time, did things that came right out of the darkest pages of our history. Uh, don't forget that Andrew Jackson once told the Supreme Court, you've got your, you've got your, your decision, you go enforce it. In other words, he was prepared to defy a constitutional, a U.S. Supreme Court decision. Don't forget that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was going to pack the U.S. Supreme Court with his own buddies or with people that were ideologically aligned with him in order to get what he wanted out of the Supreme Court. And don't forget that, that Thomas Jefferson and John Adams used the sedition statute to prosecute critics under the Alien and Sedition Act. All of these things were happening within a month's time in Romania. They were going to defy a constitutional court decision. They were going to pack the court in order to get the result they wanted so they could throw out the president and gain control of these prosecutors. Uh, and anybody that criticized them, they couldn't do this to me because I had diplomatic immunity, although they would have loved to have done it to me. Uh, but any critic who went to, to, uh, to, to Brussels and complained was charged with sedition, seditious libel. For those of you who are historians or lawyers, we had that tradition here, and we did it, uh, we borrowed it from the Brits, by the way, the whole idea of seditious libel. So all of these things were happening at the same time. We saw the stability of the government at stake, and we saw the rule of law at stake. Now, what I take from that experience was, in the end, the sensible people in the government co governing coalition listened to us and responded positively. And in the end, the rule of law prevailed in Romania. The court system was not tampered with. The Constitutional Court was left alone, uh, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the president was not impeached. This was, but this was not about saving Bisescu. This was about saving the rule of law, and the rule of law survived, and I feel very good about where things are going right now in Romania because now there's very civil cohabitation going on between the, the president of Romania and the, and the leader of the coalition, uh, 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 Prime Minister Ponta, and they have agreed upon a set of prosecutors who, you know, look, 
It's not an ideal set of prosecutors. I mean, there are probably other people that other people would have wanted, but on the whole, it's a good solution. In Romania right now, the critical decision is who are the prosecutors? Because after all, to put this in context, what happened in Romania, and you know, this is my amateur historian uh, going on, is there was, the wall did come down in Romania. It was the most violent revolution of all of the revolutions. More people died in Romania than anywhere uh, uh, along the wall in 1989. But what really happened in Romania was for like 10 years, nothing really changed because the elites in the Romanian establishment, in the Securitate, which is their KGB, and in the Communist Party just moved right in to taking over the government and taking over uh, the large corporate interests, taking over the state-owned enterprises, nothing really changed. And those people still have tremendous influence in Romania. And the way they stay in power is through corruption. Corruption is the dead hand of the past in Romania, holding on to reform and democratization. And what's encouraging about Romania is there are young people in Romania who now that they're in the EU, they can travel anywhere, who will leave Romania and they will vote with their feet. But they want to stay because they see tremendous potential here. And the critical issue is whether you apply the rule of law. And the cutting edge of that is what these prosecutors can do. Can they go after the people that are brazen and, and corrupt and, and, uh, and stand in the way of the rule of law? And that's why the appointment of these prosecutors is so important. And I feel very encouraged with where things have gone within the last month, even within the last few days. Okay, last question from me, and then we'll have about 20-25 minutes for a Q&A from the audience. Now, obviously, we look now, uh, we discussed 2012, but we are in 2013, and 2014 is coming and so on. So, now that even both President Basescu that you mentioned and Prime Minister Ponta, who is actually the leader of the most uh, influential party and most popular party in Romania, but they both declared recently that the worst of the economic crisis is over in Romania. And uh, they expect and probably we should expect a certain type of economic recovery. At the same time, and we are here at uh, the Hill Center and we read the newspapers and so on, the situation in Europe, I teach European politics to my students, the situation I travel to Europe at least once a year, uh, both Western Europe, Eastern Europe and so on. I read European newspapers from different countries and so on. So if you look into Greece, if you look into Spain, uh, if you look into the recent local elections in UK, uh, if you look into the Italian elections, with 25% going to the star movement, five star movement, uh, run by a basically a clown, uh, and so on and so forth. Europe is in turmoil, that's no doubt. Uh, and we see uh, Europe being more or less attacked at this moment, but if you want, let's call it populism, or something that Latin America has exp did experience in the past, and it's not over uh, completely, which is Peronismo. Uh, the general Juan Domingo Peron used to say, uh, I have two uh, hands, the left hand and the right hand, and I use each one when necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the left and right. So, be, or a great Latin American writer, Argentine writer, Jorge Luis Borges used to say about Peronismo, they are neither left nor right, they are incorrigible. No. Uh, okay, so they are neither left nor right, they are simply incorrigibles. Okay, so uh, this being said, do you, Mark, expect at this moment, looking into Romania and following Romanian events, the same type of turbulence coming in Romania, or do you think that Romania is a more stable place than it was a year or two ago? I, th I think it's a more stable place than it was two or three, a, a year ago. Um, but there's, you know, the story is the last chapters have not been written, just like they haven't been written in the United States. Um, first of all, the economics, uh, I mean, we have experts here from the IMF that know a lot more about this than I do, but I think what the IMF and the EU and the World Bank did in terms of the conditions it imposed upon Romania and continues to impose on Romania helped Romania position itself better than almost any other Eastern European country except perhaps Poland. Don't forget, Romania's debt to GDP is only 40%. You know, ours is much higher than that, probably twice that. Uh, so it doesn't have a high debt. Uh, it has economic growth, uh, you know, that is beginning to take place. Uh, it's way ahead of, uh, of Spain or Portugal 
or Greece, uh, maybe even France, uh, in terms of its positioning. Now, whether it will succeed in continuing to reform and stabilize itself will depend entirely, I believe, on whether the institutions itself are allowed to remain independent. I mean by that the court system, the prosecutors, uh, the, uh, the regulatory system, whether it remains transparent or becomes more transparent, uh, whether tenders are handled in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a reasonable way, and most importantly, I think, whether it continues to privatize its state-owned enterprises. Right now, a significant portion of the GDP of Romania is owned by the state, and it's run by politicians uh, who are either corrupt or incompetent in many cases. Uh, and this is a big problem because Romania was, uh, at one time, both the breadbasket of Europe and the energy hub of Europe. Uh, and it still has those assets, and those assets are in state hands and they need to be in private hands. And so if these reforms continue and these institutions remain independent, I think there's no limit to what Romania can accomplish. Uh, the best model for Romania is Poland. Here's a little known fact. I bet you nobody in this room realizes this. The IMF probably understands this. The only country in Europe that didn't go into recession in the last five years Poland. And the reason is because Poland has reformed its state. They have, they have begun to privatize their state-owned enterprises. And they've taken the lessons that we and the West have taught them about free markets and independence and the rule of law. And they've applied them. And the standard of living for the average Pole has gone up. And that will happen in Romania. And when that happens, these forces will just wither and die, the bad forces. Because I am a, I am a true believer in the power of the rule of law in free markets. Uh, and I think that will happen in Romania. Now, you know, there's always the threat, uh, we see it in Hungary now, of authoritarian right-wing uh, type forces having an untoward effect on, on democracies. Uh, but as long as we apply these rules and as long as the multilateral institutions in the U.S. and Great Britain uh, and, the, uh, and NATO continue to insist on these these uh, rules, uh, it will be good for the Romanian people and it will be good for the United States because we will have a stronger, more reliable ally in Romania. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. And at this moment we have, let's say, about 20 minutes yeah. of uh, questions and answers. If you can kindly, if you feel like, uh, identify yourself. It's not mandatory, it's uh, preferred. Okay, so please, any questions? And don't the questions don't need to be about what we just talked about? They can be like absolutely. What is, I mean, I had like, three other it, questions. I can come with my it's, own. It's like, what's it like to be an ambassador or whatever? What or, do you think about Romanian food? What do I think about Romanian food? But How's the, food? <laughs> the food is phenomenal, by the way. Um, actually, you know, this weekend there is a, a Romanian food festival run by the one of the Romanian Orthodox churches here which I encourage you to go to if you want. I can get you the details if you're interested. It's very good, very rich food. Uh, although the, the, uh, the vegetables, by the way, are the best organic vegetables I have ever had. The, you, you, you won't, you'll finally taste what a real tomato tastes like, as opposed to what we have. Even a uh, guy in, in Rehoboth, much better. Go ahead, guy. I know that's not what you wanted to ask me about. Well, I, I think the question guy is asking is, as a U.S. ambassador, talk a little bit about the tension between the rule of law and supporting institutions and democracy on the one hand and the strategic interest of the United States, which may not be consistent with that for national security reasons. Is that the essence of the question? Yeah. Uh, I didn't have to face that problem in Romania, and I'm glad I didn't, because uh, the strategic interest of Romania in terms of supporting the United States, for example, in Afghanistan or putting the missiles in, uh, uh, accepting the missiles in, in Devasela, which is down in the southern part of Romania where the missiles are going to go, was never a question, okay, on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, the goals of the government, the goals of the IMF, the goals of the EU, uh, the goals of eventually even the governing coalition now was to support the rule of law and to support uh, democracy. Uh, and I strongly believe, I'm a big believer in a book called Why Nations Fail by two, if, if you're interested, you can get it off of uh, Kindle. It's an excellent book that talks about the importance in economic development of building empowering institutions and destroying what they call 
extractive elites, which you have many of in Romania, and in many of these countries. And by that, what they mean is that when you look at the countries around the world with the highest standard of living, with the most stable governments, who are the most reliable allies of the United States, they have institutions that empower people, that allow anybody in that country, like in the United States, to become president, in effect, to, to become anything they want to become. They're meritocracies on the one hand, and they've taken on their extractive elites. By that, they mean people who benefit from corruption or, the, or uh, the breakdown of the rule of law. Now, we've had that in the United States. I spoke of this often when I spoke out on this issue. I said, a hundred Romania is facing 20 years after its revolution what we were still facing a hundred years after our revolution. Remember, uh, our, in, our, in our Constitution, we wrote our Constitution in 1789. What was it like in the United States in 1889? We had robber barons who basically violated and, and thumbed their nose at the rule of law. They controlled the parties and they controlled the media. Sound familiar? That's what Romania was to some extent uh, when I got there. And it still is to some extent. But the great thing about Romania is they're beginning to confront these issues. And it's making it a more stable country and a more stable ally. And they will therefore be able to implement our strategic goals more effectively as they become more stable, as their standard of living goes up, as the rule of law is applied. I really firmly believe that. I'm not an expert on what happened in Benghazi, and thank God I wasn't the ambassador there or any of the, anywhere else in North Africa. I don't have to face these issues. I can just tell you what will work in Romania. This will work in Romania. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, uh, I'll just repeat the question, which is uh, uh, the questioner is asking about the Aegis system. That's the missile system that we're putting in there. Aegis is a missile system that we now have on ships. Uh, and it's, uh, that whole technology and that missile system is now going to be put on shore. So that's why the, the missile system is actually called Aegis Ashore. Now, uh, I've tried to make this clear to the Romanian people and the Romanian government uh, and everybody who would be willing to listen to me. Romania, I hope, did not agree to accept these missiles in the hopes that billions of dollars of U.S. investment would flow from the missiles. They are totally unrelated. This is a strategic decision that the United States made and Romania joined in and that NATO uh, supports to defend the people of Romania and Europe from threats from the Middle East, missile threats from the Middle East. It, it's essentially all it is, okay? There will be some investment. It's, it's uh, not significant that will take place in Devisalo. This is the area in uh, southwestern uh, Romania where the missiles will take place. I think the value uh, that uh, the missile placement has upon U.S. investment and U.S. strategic relationship with Romania is a statement by the United States, which, by the way, most sophisticated in Romanians, especially in the military establish, under, establishment, understand, is that it's basically an endorsement of the commitment that we feel towards Romania and the reliability that we see in the Romanian military in particular and the trustworthiness that we see there uh, that will hold Romania in good stead. It makes it easier to convince an American company uh, to invest in Romania when you know that the President of the United States and the, the U.S. Congress and now the Romanian Senate have agreed that this huge investment and decision is going to be made here. I want to tell you one short story. The night that uh, um, the Under Secretary of State for Arms Control, Alan Tauscher, and I had our final meeting with President Basescu, and he said, yes, we will accept the, the missiles. We went back to my residence, and I had several of the top military people and strategic thinkers in, in Romania at my house. And one of them said to me, very insightful thought, going back to California dreaming and, and uh, the return of the Americans. She said to me, tonight is 65 years to the day of Yalta. The day we, and so that was the symbolism. The United States had the decision where to put these missiles. And it's driven by physics, basically. There were four or five countries. And I won't get into the countries because this is on YouTube. But I can tell you, it wasn't even a close decision as to where to put the missiles. The only country you could put the missiles in was Romania. Now, in terms of the corruption issues, those issues are not going to be driven by the missiles. They're going to be driven by what the IMF does what the EU does with the so-called uh, continuing verification mechanism, a very innovative 
benchmarking mechanism that the EU is using to encourage the Romanians and the reformers to accomplish their goals in terms of rebuilding uh, the court system and the prosecutors, et cetera. That's what's going to drive that. It's not going to be the presence of the missiles. So um, I think they're, they're an important in, in endorsement of Romania and where it stands uh, in terms of the constellation of countries in that region. And it's, it's, it's both realistic and aspirational. We hope that Romania will continue to move in the direction it's headed in terms of consolidating its democracy and its free market system. Let's have one more. No, we, we, I'm ready. To, if you have a okay. number of questions, I'm ready. So I'll stay let's have one. three questions. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask if you what, could talk a little about the press. Whether uh, well, the, the media, the old style media in Romania is facing the same problems that they are here. The, the internet is beginning. By the way, Romania has the fastest growing Facebook market in, in Europe. So it's, and you have, and by the way, Roman one thing you'll learn about Romanians as you get to know them, it sounds like you know something about Romanians, they are very smart. They are very technologically facile. My son works at Microsoft uh, in Redmond, third most spoken language in Redmond, Romanian. Okay? They're brilliant. They are brilliant and they use the internet and that eventually is going to undercut the power of online media just like it is here. But the online media is very powerful in Romania. Uh, and the television stations in particular are very powerful. The issue is not the government control of the uh, media. That's really not a big problem in Romania. It is something of a problem, but it's not the se most serious. The problem is the old elite moguls and people with commercial interests who don't necessarily have the best interests of Romania at heart, but they have their own interest at heart, controlling the media. Uh, I was the victim of a lot of this. I considered it a badge of courage. By the way, when I got a lot of negative press, and I still get a lot of negative press, one of my uh, colleagues at the State Department, because I was nervous about this, I, I insisted that all the clips and all the TV transcripts go back and that the people in, in Washington read it. And I called one of my, the Deputy Assistant Secretary once and I said, is this concerning you? And she said, if you're not taking incoming, you're bombing the wrong targets. And I took a lot of incoming. And a lot of that incoming was driven by people who didn't like what I had to say. And I just came to understand that. And uh, by the way, I'm still being attacked because I just went on the board of a very important equity in Romania, a fund that plays a big role in reforming the state-owned enterprises, and I'm still being attacked. But I considered if I wasn't being attacked, then I wouldn't be doing anything. So uh, now, to say that's unique to Romania is not fair to Romania. We, we have that here, and it's true in, throughout the world. So uh, in that sense, it's just a reality of Romania. Now, there's some very good journalists, very, very courageous journalists in Romania. I'd put some of them up against any of our investigative journalists uh, here in the United States. But I'd say a good half of the media is, you know, uh, is, has, is very much influenced by these political institutions like we were in the 1890s by the rail, rail barons. Steve? Yeah. What was it like to be an ambassador? It was the best job I've ever had. It was the most difficult and exhausting job I've ever had. It was very difficult on Libby, my wife, uh, because uh, the, the, you're on all the time. Basically, you went nowhere in Romania without, first of all, a big security detail. And uh, you had no privacy. Uh, Libby, Libby likes to tell the story that, first of all, especially after Benghazi, the security was very intense. But it was intense for the whole three years I was there. Uh, you know, in my car, wherever I drove anywhere, there were two Romanians. And they were, I loved these guys. They were wonderful, great security, and men and women. I had a driver and a, and a security guy sitting in the front seat, Libby and I in the back seat, and a chase car with five men and women in it, packed to the gills uh, with all the weapons you can imagine. Uh, and in the car, if Lib and I had an argument, I know you find that hard to believe that we would ever disagree on anything, we would do it in writing. Mm -hmm. Or when I got home, when we did have some privacy in the house, uh, I would get an earful, if you can imagine. All saved up all day long. Uh, but I mean, it was, that was hard. That is really hard. And when you walk out the, you know, when you're in your house at night, you have privacy. As soon as you walk out the door, as soon as you walk out on the street, you've got 
five men and women following you, and you know it's uh, you know it's a little intimidating. And and you there was no way to go into a small Romanian village quietly. You know there were sirens, and I found that uh, disconcerting, uh, although necessary. I mean I uh, I never did anything to test the security uh, restraints that were placed on me, although it was tempting. Uh, so I found that hard, but I found, uh, I, and I also found it stressful that, especially during the crisis, the, you know, seven hour time distance difference, I wasn't gonna call up the assistant secretary and say, I'm about to say this. I just said it and hoped I would be supported. And that was stressful because, you know, there were times when I was worried, will they really back me up? Now, the great thing was they didn't question a thing I did. And when, when it was necessary to send somebody over to send a clearer message when, that was, when it was questioned, and by the way, I was questioned by people in the governing coalition as to whether I spoke for the United States. The, the NSC insisted that, someone, that the, secretary, the assistant secretary come over and send the message. By the way, that's why that fellow said that about the secretary, about the, defense, the State Department, because the message was unequivocal don't question the U.S. ambassador, he speaks for us. It's not like I was on a frolic of my own there. I was doing this because I was told to do it and because I believed in it. That was difficult, that was stressful. I think for Lib, it was hard to see a lot of the negative press, but I think we got immune to it eventually. But uh, I'll tell you, I'll, 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 I'll answer a couple more questions, but I'll tell you one last thing, which anybody in this room would, would I think, uh, appreciate. When you're the U.S. ambassador, and you walk through the front of the embassy, there are Marines standing there. As you, the Marines, by the way, don't protect you, they protect the embassy. But, uh, but when you walk into the embassy, they salute you and you salute them back. And you know, they're not saluting me, they're saluting me because I'm representing you, because I represent the President of the United States. It is a thrill to know, as a lawyer, that you have the best client in the world. And, uh, when, they, when you're the U.S. ambassador or you're any American official and they play the national anthem and you see the flag and you're in Romania and you realize what respect you, that flag and the United States has, it is a thrill. It's something that I'll never experience again. And it was, it's been wonderful. It was an incredible experience. Mm. Yeah. What, what will, well, so the, your question is, what will the, when will the Romanians become disillusioned? With the, I'll tell you a story. I, I worry about that a lot, by the way. Uh, I tried very hard, and by the way, this was where Libby, my wife, many of you know, was incredibly helpful. Because uh, every time I said something where I came across as a little self-righteous or a little indignant, you can imagine that those conversations in the car were replicated back in the bedroom. And I tried not to do it again. It was extremely important. I think the risk the United States has is, is that we can be overbearing and self-righteous and indignant in a way that's unfair to a country that, by the way, has only experienced democracy, I would say, for 10 years, not 20 years. Uh, and so they, you know, we're expecting, and Roman young Romanians are expecting for Romania something that it took us 100 years to accomplish. Remember, we didn't really consolidate our democracy until Teddy Roosevelt did the reform movement in the early 20th century, over 100 years after our revolution. That's why he's on Mount Rushmore. Romania does not yet have its Teddy Roosevelt, but they're trying to do in, in 10 years what it took us 120 years to do. So I, I try and remind myself of that. The other thing that I worry about um, is that we will let Romania down. Uh, and this is why I feel very strongly that it's an obligation of me and others who have served and care about Romania to stay engaged with Romanian Americans here and try and tell the story of Romania to, to other Americans and stay engaged with Romania. Uh, and by the way, there are a lot of wonderful Americans in Romania every day right now. Even though we no longer have USAID money, at any given time, I had my staff figure this out, there are between four and 500 Americans doing volunteer work in Romania, and that's not counting the 100 Peace Corps volunteers we have in Romania. Or friends of mine like a venture capitalist buddy of mine who goes to Romania once a month. He's been there 60 times since 2000, trying to mentor young Romanians. We need to do more of that, because Romanians look to us for this. And we, one of the things that I did, I bought the art for the embassy. 
you know, for our new embassy, uh, our new uh, uh, resident, our new uh, embassy facility. We built a huge, beautiful new embassy uh, in, in uh, outside by the airport. And I bought a painting of an old Romanian woman done by a phenomenal young Romanian artist. And what struck me about the painting, it's a painting of a woman from a small village in Romania. And you, the painting is huge. It's like half the size of that wall there. But you have to stand back from this wall to look at it. And the expression on this woman's face is one of skepticism uh, and a little bit of fear. And I wanted my staff to see that painting every day. Because the risk we run as Americans is, is that we will forget what this country has been through and we will let Romania down. And I think it's very important that everybody in our embassy keep that in mind. And, you know, I would hope the same for Romanians, too, uh, towards us. But I think that's a big risk. I, I did a poll after the crisis this summer because I was worried that our brand had been damaged because I was attacked a lot and the, and the United States was attacked a lot. And, I, and what was very gratifying about that was that actually our brand value increased during that period because Romanians, especially young Romanians, want us speaking out on these issues because in some cases they're afraid to. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's an important obligation. But the delicate balance is you need to do it in a way that's positive and reaffirming on the one hand and not self-righteous and indignant on the other. And that's a, I'm telling you, having to have it do it every day, it was hard. And I, I'm confident my successor will do the same. Hmm. Oh, one more question? Okay. Anti-Semitism is still a problem in Romania, uh, but uh, I mean, just to tell you the the quick, my my family was obviously Jewish uh, in North, came from Bodishan in northwestern northeastern Romania, and my grandfather was from Chisinau in Moldova. So, both sides of my father's family was from that area and fled the pogroms uh, in the late 19th century. Now, uh, there were 800,000 Jews in Romania before the war. 400,000 died in the Holocaust. And the next 400, of, of those 400,000, almost the, all the rest of them fled Romania, they immigrated from Romania to Israel and to the United States and to other countries in Western Europe. There's a very small Jewish population in Romania now, maybe five to 7,000. They're not doing that poorly. They're pretty old and they're pretty embattled. Um, you don't see the kind of overt <clears throat> anti-Semitism in Romania that you see in Hungary now. Uh, and Romania, and I think uh, the, the president, Basescu, deserves credit for this, has done a very good job of trying to come to grips with the anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. Uh, the Elie Wiesel Institute, Elie Wiesel was from Romania, and we created a, uh, he helped to create an institute that educates uh, Romanians on the problem. Now, in terms of treatment of minorities, <clears throat> the big problem in Romania, I think, is Roma. This is the way Roma are treated. The racism that I see directed at, and it's not so institutional as it is cultural there, uh, is as bad as anything I saw growing up in the Deep South. Uh, Romania has to do a lot of work on that. Now, the current prime minister deserves credit for trying to come to grips with that. Uh, he has a very good Roma advisor, <clears throat> and I am hopeful, but I think the, the challenges are going to be very, very big. Uh, you know, the, uh, if they don't come to grips with this, and I, I, indeed it's an issue both uh, for, the, uh, for the way they're treated in terms of just human, humanity, but also the education of their young people. If they don't come to grips with this, 25% of the young people in Romania are going to be illiterate. You cannot run a modern economy in that. with that. This is a real threat to the security and stability of Romania. Okay. <coughs> this being said, I think that... Okay, the concluding thoughts. I think we had a uh, wonderful opportunity to listen to some very well-informed and informative and wise uh, analysis. Uh, so it was not just opinions and impressions, but you had a uh, thoughtful approach to, we had a thoughtful approach to the problems of Romania, which in many respects are the problems of the post-Soviet, uh, post-communist world. Uh, Mark interesting refer to things that happen east of Romania, and that's of course an important uh, lesson. 
uh, when you have an authoritarian dictatorial regime in Belarus, when you have basically authoritarianism re-emerging, if ever disappeared completely in uh, Russia, when you have basically the great results of the Orange Revolution uh, being more or less becoming a shambles in Ukraine. So all this being said, Romania is uh, doing pretty well. It depends uh, what you are looking into. Uh, I would also say something I saw the ambassador several times. Any t every time I went there, I saw you. And uh, I would say something that he played a very important role. And any ambassador would continue to play an important role because Romania has come to terms, n no country has fully come to terms with its past. Uh, but there are some countries who have come closer to a kind of confrontation with the past and countries that have refused this type of pr approach. Romania had two dictatorships. And uh, I know that uh, Ambassador Gittenstein was involved in helping basically both uh, reckonings with the past. One dictatorship was, let's say, broadly between 1940 and 1944, and it was a fascist dictatorship, and that included the Romanian Holocaust. Uh, it took a lot of time and a lot of moral determination for the Romanian elites even to accept the term the Holocaust in Romania or the Romanian Holocaust. It was not until 2003 an acceptable term. Okay, period. Uh, the same thing was the problem of coming to terms with the communist past. Well, and that's a much more, I don't say it's more, both of them are very difficult, but it's a much more polarizing and devising issues because in the case of the Holocaust, the three main categories involved in any coming, you, you know, uh, you were told that it's the fact that I was the chair of the Truth Commission in Romania, the equivalent of a Truth Commission. It was not called the Truth Commission, but that's exactly what it did. Okay, so it's one of the versions of the Truth Commissions. And the three main categories that our friends from the Wiesel Commission that dealt with the uh, Holocaust and came was a report which was accepted by the then president of Romania, Ion Iliescu, okay, is that the three main categories were either extinct or moving towards extinction. I'm not saying this was any kind of normative or uh, that means the perpetrators, the victims, and the bystanders. The crimes took place between 1940 and 1944. Romania started to address this issue seriously in 2003. Calculate the age of the people, the three categories I'm talking about, and you get the answer, okay? In the communist case, all the three categories, and it's what the ambassador responded to the questions about the media. What do you do with one of the media empires, two, sorry, two of the media empires in Romania, are run without that I'm not disclosing any kind of state secret or anything like that by two exposed former secret police collaborators. That's fact. Two of the most important. Okay, are these people interested in exposing the crimes of communism? Are these people interested in discussing, you know, the, the atrocities that took place? Marius, who just spoke, worked for an institute for the investigation of the crimes of communism. What we have seen is basically the takeover of such an institute by people who are going to speak about anything but those things seriously, because it's not in the interest of at least two categories, the bystanders and the perpetrators. And sorry to say, the victims have most passed away. So we don't have, I mean, you have, however, a certain number of vested interests among these people who you know, compromise their souls Somebody once called the uh, French, uh, whatever it, uh, it was, uh, uh, the collaborationism in France during World War II, and the term was in French, le cancer des âmes, the cancer of the souls. It's the cancer of the souls. And this, in Germany, it was relatively easy, because German, East Germany was absorbed by West Germany, and they had independent judges, independent prosecutors, they had all of this. There is no Federal Republic of Romania to absorb Romania and offer uh, you know, independent lawyers, independent uh, tribunals. No, Romanians, the Germans got rid of all their scientific socialism, whatever, Marxism, Leninist professors, because they had whom to replace and so on. In Romania, all the professors of Marxism, Leninism are now professors of democracy. <laughs> No, I'm not quite as pessimistic as Vlad is about this, but I think you know, if you look back at what happened in Romania in the 40s and what happened in the 50s and 60s in Romania, it was a breakdown of the rule of law. They had no court system that was reliable. The Bar Association was, was entirely 
co-opted and corrupt. Uh, the media was, you know, played no role. So that's why I believe building independent, empowering institutions is critical to the future of Romania. And the role of the IMF in this, the role of the United States in this, the role of the EU in this, and the role of average Romanians in this is going to be critical. Okay, thank you.